is in Singapore, so I'm going to hand over her to introduce the Elevate piece. Thanks, Katie. Thank you very much, Caroline and uh, Caroline, and for those those very kind words. Really appreciate it. Um, I hope we uh, we can we can live up to those words. I'm sure we can. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we're really looking forward to, to being here um, and sharing some of our some of our thoughts, some of our um, some of our practices, and and, and talking about um, supply chain trends um, and how they might be affecting companies over in Australia. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, I'm sitting in Singapore, um, but I have um, a couple of colleagues on the line as well. Um, Filippo will be sharing. The screen in just a second he's the he's the expert today so he'll be you'll be hearing his voice the most um but i just wanted to introduce the other colleagues on it on, on on the on the call today so myself um katie I, i'm based in singapore as i said i look after the um supply chain consulting across this region so across asia pacific Filippo, we will be hearing from most today, as I mentioned, he um, is our expert in analytics so he'll be looking he'll be really diving into the trends and the data that we have, which gives some really, really, I think, interesting insights into what's happening in, in supply chains globally. And we'll be um, zooming down into what that means for, for Australian companies and, and how that might um, affect some of the operations and some of the work that, you, that you'll be doing and will be needing to do. Um, also on the line, we have David. Um, David is our um, local, so he's sitting in Melbourne, our local contact for you all. So he looks after client services um, over there in Australia. So. Um, we'll, we'll be putting our email addresses up at the end of the call. So if you do want to contact any of us, you can, you, you can, you can go ahead and do that. So great to meet you all. And at this point, I'll pass over to Filippo. Um, hello, everyone. This is Filippo Sebastian. Um, as Katie introduced me, I'm a head of analytics. I work with the data Elevate. And I try to make sense of all the data that we collect every year. But first of all, let me give a, um, a quick introduction about what is Elevate. Elevate is a leading ESG supply chain solution providers. We provide a unique set of data that enable corporate brands to conduct risk resilience and effective program management. We also help investors and financial community to best understand what are the issues in the supply chain. Um, this unique data set, exactly. We've been collecting data for more than 10 years, um, approximately 18,000 audit, uh, audits per year, each audit with, 300, with more than 300 of data points. And together with the audit data, we also be collecting um, information related to uh, coming from workers. So more than 2,000 workers survey every year, more than 6,000 grievance mechanism data points collected every month. Um, we are not only uh, a, an audit, like a social, compli uh, social compliance company, we also provide, of course, e-learning services and we collect e-learning data. And with all this data, we provide the corporate scorecards, um, vendor scorecards and supplier side scorecards to our clients. Um, finally, this data is instrumental for us to develop the supply chain um, risk indices that we'll be introducing shortly. Um, Elevate produces the every year, every, right now, every six months, Elevate is going to produce the uh, uh, supply chain ESG risk ratings to evaluate the company exposure to ESG risk in the global supply chain. All these risk ratings are coming from audits, our social, uh, environmental, and, uh, and the compliance audits media information, so all the information that we scrape from the web, public domain data set, but also government uh, website information. Um, using all this information, using the 18,000 uh, audit data points and complementing with other these other sources of information, we produce the risk ratings. We have two different types of risk rating. We have the geography risk ratings that cover more than 80 countries and more than 100 provinces, sub-national uh, administrative region. 
And then we have the product risk grading. The product risk grading co cover more than 250 products and commodities in the supply chain. The geography, the geography is creating over five key areas, labor, health and safety, environment, business ethics, and management system. Why in terms of product risk, we evaluate the overall risk of a specific product and also the country product related risk. Let's start with the operating context. What is happening right now in the supply chain? Well, the first thing that we really need to talk about is the impact that COVID has been having on the supply chain. Um, uh, we have used our own uh, web crawling tool. A web crawling tool is an instrument that we have built to collect news, web posts, everything that's posted about the web, uh, on the web, about four, more than 4,000 global suppliers. And um, we've been collecting information related risk, related to compliance challenges, related to their workers. And this information has helped us to basically uh, assess the pulse of the supply chain, understand what are the challenges that are happening right now in the supply chain. Well, something that we have seen in the last two, three years is that with the, with the rise of, uh, of COVID-19, we have seen an explosion of uh, news related to compliance violations. Um, we have seen an increase of, of course, of health and safety news as work sites have become a cluster of COVID-19 infection, but also as uh, work sites have stopped investing in health and safety uh, measures as, as they were doing more before. We have also seen an increase in layoffs and related um, compliance issues like severance pay. And finally, we have seen a in significant increase in uh, forced labor related violation. A 33% um, in, the, in the last month, but a 157% year on year. Now, I want to make, a, it's important to make this premise that uh, more news doesn't necessarily correlate with more occurrence, but we are seeing these warning, warning signals and, and, and we have seen it also correlating with our audit data. That's why we think there is a, um there there is a there is a new emergency in the supply chain covid is not the only issues that uh, is been going on in the supply chain um starting back really in 2017 there has been an escalation in trade tension between china and the us and at the same time the us has also been um, um scaling up the use of uh, withhold release order so bans on import of goods that um, might have been done with forced labor. Um, this continuous trade tension, this continuous uh, um, uh, supply chain disruption, that it's also coming right now as we are hearing from the challenges in, in the supply chain, are also pushing our clients, the buyers, the international buyers, to accelerate their reshifting in the supply chain. What are the new sourcing markets that I need to go to so that I can uh, um, um, produce more effectively and more efficiently? or source good more effectively and efficiently. Um, of course, this means that also our clients are entering new markets they are not really aware of. They don't really understand the potential compliance challenges. And that's where we come uh, providing our ESG risk ratings to give them an understanding of what kind of challenges they might encounter in the new factory, in the new farm, in the new warehouses. Let's start with a global overview. Um, as we mentioned, um, COVID-19 has been a, a significant uh, game changer in the supply chain. It's, it's led to a significant impact to the supply chain and to the compliance. We have seen that, that condition, conditions overall in the work sites have deteriorated by, according to our risk indicators, by 1.2% compared to 2020. And we have seen that this was significantly driven by the impact of COVID-19 in terms of health and safety compliance related um, standards. We have seen, as we mentioned before, we have seen uh, work sites turning into COVID cluster, but we have seen also um, uh, a surge in those traditional areas of risk, such as fire safety, such as building safety. Uh, at the same time, uh, the health and safety crisis was 
also has also triggered a labor standard crisis. We have seen uh, um, a lot of factories, a lot of suppliers struggling to pay wages on time or to pay their workers at all. We have seen uh, um, significant violations in also in uh, in uh, in hours worked and uh, uh, in in days worked. Where um, in terms of uh, of impact. We have seen uh, the effects being really heterogeneous in the supply chain. There have been certain areas of the supply chain that actually have improved their uh, sourcing uh, uh, practices, their compliance standards, and others that have, um, uh, have had more challenges, have seen a decrease in, uh, in compliance standards. Um, this is the case, for instance, for European countries that have seen their standards decrease significantly. But most of all, this is the cases for the key sourcing areas, these key sourcing countries, such as China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Turkey. They all experience a significant drop in compliance standards. On the other hand, we have seen some uh, improvements in key countries in Central, in Central America, and we have seen some improvements in Southeast Asia. Well, where should Australian business really uh, focus uh, their efforts when it comes to compliance, when it comes to risk prevention? The first key areas of risk that we want to talk to you uh, about today, it's, it's forced labor. Um, first of all, because there has been a significant increase in uh, regulatory risk related to forced labor. Back in 2012, um, there has been a wave, uh, started a wave of regulation that has been addressed at forced labor with, uh, with, a, with, a, with the first, um, we call Modern Slavery Act, the California Transparency in Supply Chain Act that came in effect in January 2012. It was then followed by the UK Modern Slavery Act, by the US Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act, and finally by the Australian Modern Slavery Act in 2018. Now, um, there has been an increased pressure on businesses to be um, to be to tackle forced labor in their supply chain, but this is not only related to the government regulatory pressure. There have been other actors that's also been playing an important role in putting pressure on businesses, such as multilateral agency, uh, the ILO, ILO, the IOM, uh, the the USD, and uh, of course. With, uh, with the effort that was required businesses to put for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. There have also been a significant pressure coming from in this industry initiative, the EPI, RBA, SEDEX, or the Fair Labor Association. And finally, there are more external stakeholders, such as civil society, NGOs, that have been really pushing a lot for, uh, for businesses to uh, increase uh, their uh, focus on tackling modern slavery together with emerging in investor interests. So investors right now are also significantly requiring uh, businesses to, um, to make sure that they are clear from forced labor in their supply chain, not only among the tier one, but also down deeper in their, uh, among their tier two, tier three suppliers. Filippo? Um, yes. If I can interrupt, we do have a question um, from Kevin. Is a 1.2, 1.3 movement considered significant slash crisis? 1.2, 1.3 movement. Yeah. Mm. Kevin, do, Kevin, do you want do you want to articulate your 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 question? Yeah, I might, I might not be familiar with these two movements. Which was the the 1.2 to 1.3 percent? Oh. The, the changes in ratings. I think yeah, so, let's yeah. consider it quite significant. Consider that we are, um, we are here evaluating the 15 uh, top key exporting countries. So 1.2, 1.3, it, 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 it's quite significant for us. Um, of course, uh, be, you need to consider this is an average. There are countries that are going up and countries that are going down, but on average, these are huge number. Of course, minus 13% in health and safety, it's really what is um, 
it's, it's, it's staggering right now. It's really what is uh, imp impressing us right now because of, of, of the obvious disruption that we've seen due to the um, surge in COVID cases and, uh, and the related health and safety violation. But yeah, I would consider this a significant, uh, um, a significant change. Um, I'll try to stop uh, now and then to take questions. I really, I think it's better if we make this more interactive than just uh, a very long monologue. So thanks, Kevin, for your question. And if you have other questions, please uh, um, um, just uh, just let me know. Or Katie, let me know because I'm I'm not very good at keeping track of questions on oh, on, well uh, on WebEx. Um, so as we were saying, there are multiple actors that are putting pressure right now on businesses to be to, to tackle uh, modern slavery in their supply chain. And the last one being investors. Uh, what is forced labor? Um, the usual pre preconception of forced labor is, of course, um, a workers in chain on a production floor or workers locked up in a factory. But forced labor, it's, it's way more... Um, how to say, um, it, it takes way many different forms than the, 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 the more obvious one. Um, referring to the traditional um, definition of forced labor, forced labor is a situation in which persons are coerced to work through the use of violence or intimidation, or by more subtle means, such as accumulated debt, retention of identity papers, or threat of the initiation to immigration authorities. The ILO, use 11 different indicators of forced labor that we use also to evaluate condition of forced laborers in the supply chain. Um, forced labor is not an issue that's related to a specific region. We have seen forced labor in basically in the last three years surging everywhere in the supply chain, whether it's the agricultural supply chain in Europe, in the US, or in Australia, whether it's the cocoa farming in Western Africa, um, um, construction of apparel industries in, in South Asia, uh, rubber, seafood in Southeast Asia, the cotton and in, 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 in apparel supply chain in, in East Asia. And, uh, and so this is really to highlight that the risk of, of forced labor, it's widespread and it goes beyond our usual uh, preconception. Um, so, so just a question. Yes. Uh, some people might be a bit surprised to see that uh, Australia isn't stunningly green, but in fact is yellow, which is medium risk. Could you say a little bit more about that? Um, well, I mean, the way we define our risk scores, the way we, we, we assi assign ratings to country, it basically comes, to, as I mentioned, to different sources, the audits. And we have seen a significant risk of foreign migrant worker exploitation in agricultural sectors in, uh, in Australia in the, in, in, the, in the past years. And this still continues today. Um, so that has significantly uh, uh, dragged down the risk scores for Australia. Um, from, from what was green up to uh, last year, to, um, so from a, a, a low risk area to a medium risk area. Thank you. So the risk of forced labor, it's also connecting also ourselves to, to the discussion about Australia. Um, the risk of forced labor, it's constantly changing in the supply chain. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it changes from year to year. And what we observed with COVID with the past year, there has been an increase of forced labor in the supply chain. 38 countries out of the 61 countries that we have rating for both 2020 and 2021, have seen a deterioration of their of, of their risk, so an increase of risk of forced labor. Um, it's a mixed bag of countries. We have seen different countries with uh, higher middle income experience an increased risk. Australia definitely is one of them. Um, Taiwan, uh, China, uh, and United States. Other countries that were already high risk, such as India, have uh, have, have kept their, their their scores. They have not improved. It. One of the interesting thing that I, I was really interested in, 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 in assessing was the, the usual, was, was assessing the usual preconception around forced labor that we have. 
Um, the first one would be forced labor. It's, it's mostly a problem for low-income country. When we actually correlate our risk scores, so the one that we produce and the GDP per capita, we see that there is actually a very poor correlation. We see there are different countries that are higher middle in income um, and have a higher prevalence of forced labor compared to uh, lower income countries. And something else I was interested in, in, in exploring was the relationship within um, public governance at least as rated by the World Bank uh, organization and for labor. And again, what we have seen is that there is not a strong relationship with it, with uh, the forced labor occurrence and public governance. What is this saying? It's basically telling us that um, forced labor is not necessarily there where we expect it. Uh, forced labor, it's really widespread, it's in, it's in, diff in different geographies. One other interesting insights it's that um, the prevalence of forced labor, it's really related also to migration and to strict immigration policies. We have seen, for instance, countries that um, are major uh, intakers of foreign migrant workers being more exposed to uh, forced labor and um, uh, having a higher risk of forced labor in their supply chain. And this has been, this has been quite exacerbating with the, with the tightening of immigration policies that have uh, basically triggered more uh, illegal immigration and have provided in the higher uh, income countries this pool of vulnerable workers, migrant workers that have no protection and are more exposed to modern slavery practices. Um, for this, is, this story is quite different for middle income or lower income countries where it's not really foreign migrant workers, but it's more domestic migrant workers that have fueled the, the forced labor crisis that we are seeing. This is, I think, this is the case of India, where a lot of the migrant workers, especially female migrant workers, are subject to forced labor conditions when they move state to state. <clears throat> but of course, this is just, I want to also reiterate that this is just one insight on forced labor. Forced labor is a very complex issue. There are so many different dynamics, but I think this was the, the, the relationship with migration is definitely one of those that um, uh, businesses should really take uh, pay attention. Um, in terms of product and industry, as I mentioned before, elevate also uh, rates different products and commodities when it comes to uh, human rights violation. Now, when I, when I talk about human rights violation, I talk about forced labor, modern slavery, but it also abuses discrimination and other forms of human rights violation that might affect um, um, workers on the work site, whether it's a, whether it's a mining work site, whether it's a, it's a factories or, or it's a farm and, uh, and, uh, and the communities around. So we assessing the human rights violation risk for different products and commodities based on basically four key determinants. The characteristic of workers that work in the supply chain, the market characteristic of the supply chain. So whether there are monopolies or high entry barriers, a strong seasonality. Uh, the analysis of uh, how clear or how opaque is the specific supply chain. And finally, where the products are usually made. Uh, where are the products coming from, whether they're coming from low, medium, high risk countries. Uh, and yes. Just a question. Um, and I think this applies to the previous slide that's come in. Um, the risk numbers here don't seem to match with the estimated prevalence rates. So for example, the Global Slavery Index has a much greater percentage of people in forced labor per capita in India than it does in the US. That's a very, 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 very good question because the global slavery index, um, for instance, analyzes modern slavery as well. Forced labor, it's it's a part of modern slavery. Um, sexual exploitation would be, for instance, uh, a case of uh, of modern slavery, where we are uh, mostly focused right now on uh, on uh, on on forced labor. But we are mostly focused right now on forced labor in the supply chain. So usually these are products that are um, that are exported or are produced for for export. But this is a very important clarification. Thank you. 
going back to the product, as I was mentioning, we are we have rated different products in the in the in the supply chain based on workers' vulnerability, market characteristics, how opaque are the business practices in the supply chain, and where the products are made. Uh, from our analysis um, on the 2020 data, we saw that um, agriculture, food, and raw materials uh, present the largest risk in terms of modern slavery and human rights violation. At the same time, when we look at a specific, specifically manufacturing sector, we see that clothing is, is it remains one of the most extreme risk uh, risk industries. I want to iterate also that um, I want to remind also that we have. Um, rated 250 between products and commodities. So not necessarily all the products and commodities, but those that we believe are more relevant in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, of, of export in our clients. A second key area of risk for us is also as we've introduced before is health and safety. <clears throat> Health and safety risk is on the rise in the global supply chain. Um, this is due to, of course, COVID, the surge of, 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 of COVID cases that we have seen last year in, uh, in Latin and developed economies. Uh, it's enough to think about what happened in the meat packaging industry in the US and Canada, in, uh, in the seafood industry in the US, or also in agriculture and manufacturing sector in Italy. These are clear cases of, uh, of explosion of COVID cases that have affected significantly the population working on it. Uh, but the surge of health and safety risk is not only limited to COVID. We have seen a rise of more traditional risks such as fire safety and chemical management and building safety. We have here proposed some of the key countries where we have noticed a significant drop or a notable drop in, uh, in after safety condition. The United States, of course, um, China, Cambodia, um, and, and of course, India, the, the country that experienced the largest drop. Here we wanna propose a couple of countries for focus, countries that have been consist consistently um, coming up in the, in, in, in the news, but also in our audit is countries that are uh, presenting a significant deterioration in times in terms of health and safety standards. India is the first one. Of course, um, as we just said, India uh, health and safety risk scores dropped significantly in the last years. And of course it was driven a lot by the, um, by the COVID situation that affected the, the country and of course also the workers in the supply chain. But India last year was also, also a protagonist, um, a main uh, a main center for different, uh, for more traditional risk, so fire safety and emergency evacuation. We, in fact, we have seen uh, um, um, India present extreme risk in, in these two areas, and we have also seen this reflected in the numerous industrial fires and industrial accidents that happened in the country in the, in the past years. Another key country for of focus was Turkey. Uh, Turkey present health and safety high risk 2.83 uh, with a significant downward trend for the past, uh, the past five years. Health, hygiene and sanitation. So the risk related to COVID pandemic and the COVID infection in, in, in the workplace, it's, it's, it's a key risk in, in the country. We have seen numerous reports of factories with uh, becoming outbreak of, uh, of, uh, of COVID-19 cases. And uh, it was very interesting to see how this risk was particularly intertwined also with the labor risk. We have seen cases of COVID-19 on the production floors and still factory manager uh, forcing workers to go to work. Um, these, uh, um, um, at the same time, together with the COVID-19 uh, with, a, with a pandemic risk in the workplace, we also see building safety and fire safety risk uh, to be really exacerbated in the, in the last few years in Turkey. Um, a question. Um, yeah. What kind of factors are taken into account in assessing health and safety risk? Ah, very good question. Of course, we, uh, first of all, um, audits. Audits, it's our main... Uh, uh, main source of uh, of information when we um, 
do this risk evaluation. Our auditors evaluate the, 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 the structure safety of the buildings. They evaluate the, the fire preparedness or the emergency preparedness of the, of the, of the, of the, of the workforce. We evaluate the, the presence of, for instance, of fire hydrants. Um, so we have uh, quite a significant checklist of violation related to health and safety that we use to provide uh, the, this risk assessment. On top of it, we also analyze the occurrence of uh, industrial accident. We use media reports, but we also use academic uh, reports that we consider more rigorous when it comes to the actual assessment of, uh, of a health and safety risk. So as you see, it's it's basically preparation to the to the to the emergency um, health and safety health and safety risk prevention, but it's also actually a occurrence of risk in the supply chain. Right. Thanks, Felipe. The final area of risk that we wanted to highlight for the uh, for the for, for the audience today, it's the transparency and visibility risk. Let's, let's start with transparency. Transparency, it's, uh, it's, our, it's one of our key goals when we go and, uh, and assess workplaces in the global supply chain. Meaning our auditors not only collect information, but also validate this information or assess the quality of this information. We validate it triangulating different data sources, workers, uh, workers, uh, or workers' opinion, worker voice, uh, we validated using looking at the, at the, at the, at the payroll uh, books. We also validate the quality of the payroll books, whether they are digitized, whether they're in paper, and whether we also train our auditors basically in correlating information and assess whether the information provided during an audit, it's, um, it's reliable or not. When, when it comes to our risk ratings, we only take in consideration the information that it's reliable. But overall, this transparency meta information, it's very important to understand also what's happening in the supply chain. And what we have seen is that key markets such as China and Vietnam have uh, uh, their transparency rate. So the, the transparency, uh, the percentage of audits that we deem transparent has been really nose diving in the past few years with the start of the trade tensions. Um, and this really matters because um, what we see in, in markets such as China, uh, that um, transparent, uh, non-transparent factories usually present way more non-compliances, not only in terms of wages, wage payments, but also related to uh, health and safety, related to environment. So we are, what we are seeing right now, it's this transparency crisis among the direct suppliers among the suppliers that the buyers ask us to audit. And uh, this is only part of the transparency of visibility uh, challenges that buyers are now experiencing. Uh, there is also a visibility or traceability matter, meaning buyers uh, are more and more challenged to really uh, understand where their products, the products they are commissioned are actually made, of, made from. Um, the, the usual assumption, of course, is that buyers goes to uh, suppliers and, and direct suppliers and the contracted suppliers and the direct suppliers will do the whole work. But unfortunately, this is not the case. What we have seen, um, especially reported by my medias, but also as we will show by the, by, by the audit data, is that um, more and more cases, there are more and more cases of tier one suppliers subcontracting the orders without authorization from the buyers. And this, of course, exposes the buyers to numerous type of violation risk in their supply chain. Risk of forced labors we have seen in India uh, in, in the past years or, uh, or in the Italian fashion supply chain. Um, but also risk uh, of health and safety. You may all remember that the, the Rana Plaza ca case in 2013, when Rana Plaza was basically subcontractors to many buyers, they were not, they were not aware of the presence of these of this suppliers, or at least some of them were not aware of the presence of these suppliers in their supply chain. So this risk basically um, through info, uh, not right subcontracting, they were connected to, to this strategy. 
Um, and uh, and this risk is particularly visible when we um, when we plot it on a map. What we have done elevated, and we want to really uh, find a way uh, to show to our clients the risk of uh, of subcontracting. And we took the, um, a specific industry, the apparel and textile industry, and we showed them. Um, we meant to really show the, the the proximity, the geographical proximity between the buyers. Uh, so between the, the tier one suppliers that subcontract without authorization and um, and the tier one suppliers and the other suppliers that we identify with extreme violation. What are these different types of extreme violation? They can be forced labor, child labor, building safety. So basically taking the, taking the case of, uh, of uh, Istanbul, Dongguan, Bangkok, we, we were able to really show that the risk of having, for, for a buyer of having your product being subcontracted by one of those blue factories that are recording to authorize subcontracting to a red factory, a factory where we identify the extreme risk of, uh, of these different extreme risk of violations. And something else also to reiterate is with COVID-19, there has been an increase of uh, unauthorized subcontracting. COVID-19 has led to significant supply chain disruption. Uh, orders are becoming more volatile, but also the access for tier one suppliers to raw material is becoming more volatile. And the best way right now for uh, tier one suppliers to really being able to be, be reliable and deliver orders on time is to uh, recur to subcontractors and it's to recur to extra resources that can help them to put together the orders on time. So we reached the summary and we will take some questions uh, later on. The first thing that we really want to iterate is that how COVID-19 and train tension incidents have shaped 2021 and will continue to shape 2022 especially COVID-19 uh, cases, we are seeing a, cons a consistent rise in, in, in geographies that uh, before they managed to manage the risk better, such as Vietnam and Indonesia. At the same time, we are seeing that buyers uh, need uh, more timely and accurate and predictive data to make sense of uh, how risk is changing fast in the, in, in the supply chain. Uh, we have seen specific risks that are, that are usually underreported compared, for instance, to the environmental risk. We have seen risk within the S of DSG uh, really exacerbating in terms of health and safety, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of forced labor. And, and what we have also seen is like how NGO and media are, uh, are putting more pressure, but also uh, having greater access to information, whether it's trade data, intelligence pl uh, platform, to really um, expose uh, the problem in the, in, in the, in the buyer supply chain, in the, in the business supply chain. Finally, we've seen government uh, moving from legislation to regulation, enforcement and penalties when it comes to uh, significant um, issues, critical issues of supply chain, such as forced labor. And the question I really want to ask our, our audience and, and the businesses, it's whether their responsible sourcing program is actually adapting fast enough to these, uh, um, to these changes and is adopting the latest tool to understand uh, the criticalities in their supply chain. And now I will pass it to Katie to, 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 to really close it and see how uh, uh, business can actually um, um, mitigate the risk of in, in, uh, in, in the supply chain. Yeah, thanks very much, Filippo. Hopefully that's been some really interesting insights for you all um, in regards to the, the risk trends that, that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and I, I'm sure you're kind of all asking your question yourself, kind of, so what, what do you do now? Now that, um, so, you know, um, a lot of this, I'm sure, is not new to you, but um, now that kind of these risks are uh, increasing in some areas, what can you do to make sure that you're mitigating those risks and, and, and avoiding um, ways that they can impact your business in, in some kind of negative way? Or what can you do also to actually create positive in, impact when it comes to some of these risk areas too? 
So risk is really just the beginning. Um, so we kind of have this at the beginning of this, this kind of flow diagram. Um, identifying your risk is, is really just the start of the process. Um, and look, really looking into your supply chain and, and diving in and looking at what your, which of your suppliers might be causing, might be posing high risks, which one might be a moderate risk, maybe some specialized risks in there as well, and which ones are high risk. This is very much a, a, um, the, the key starting point for, your, for, for the process of mitigating those risks, so identifying where they are um, and specifically who or which suppliers might be causing you some of those, those high risks. Um, I should say it's a starting point, but it's also a check-in point. So it's something that um, we would recommend that you do on a regular basis because these risks do change, as Filippo has has um, ha has highlighted. They do change as as the business environment changes, as the the general um, world climate changes. Um, so these are things that you you, you need to be checking on on a regular basis. So what do you do once you know these risks? Um, where your risks are. Um, looking at your codes, looking at, at your, your codes of conduct, looking at your policies, what is it that you want to be able to, to manage um, and mitigate? What do you expect from your suppliers? What do you expect from your, your own operations? That's certainly um, a, an important step to take to um, put into place some formal processes, some formal policies to, to mitigate and manage those risks. Some of the things that you can do, do directly with, with your suppliers is, is um, encourage them or, or ask them to get involved in, in doing self-assessment questionnaires. So this is something that you can do. Um, it's a bit of a low touch kind of um, uh, action that you can take, asking them to ask, answer certain questions around their op operations and their activities. Um, and if you do feel like, particularly for your high risk um, suppliers, then moving on to independent uh, assessment. So auditing um, um, activities would be kind of a next step for you to, to look at for that. Um, and then, of course, not just auditing your, your suppliers, there's a whole question around, OK, if you find suppliers to be um, to, to, to be displaying a lot of non-compliances or, or, or suppliers that are doing things that, that don't align with your expectations, um, do you drop them? Do you work with them? That's another decision that, that, that should be made by yourself and, and by management. We would always encourage certainly working with them where, where possible, where you can, um, through things like um, CAP management, so corrective action plans. Um, also things like e-learnings and, and, and additional training. Um, and these are all kind of things that, that um, at Elevate we do also do and we can help um, advise any of you on this as well. So, so although Philippe handles, handles all the data, um, there is a bunch of other teams at Elevate that can support um, on all these other different areas on an advisory and, and, and helping you to manage some of these risks. And then as I mentioned, going back into continuous monitoring of these, of these risks and continually checking up to make sure you're, you're keeping on top of those is important. And then down the bottom there, reporting and disclosure. Um, this might be a driver for some of you because of the, um, the, the various um, regulations in place right now, but it's also good practice, something that um, keeps, your, keeps your communication channels open with your various stakeholders um, to make sure that you're, you're, you're always kind of telling your story and, and, and reporting those, those changes and more importantly, the things that you're doing to stay on top of those, those issues and risks. So that was all that Filippo and, and I had to share today. I think we have about 20 minutes now to, to answer any questions from you. So um, I'll hand over maybe to Fuzz and Carolyn to, to moderate the, the Q&A. Sure. So thank you so much, um, Katie. Thank you, Filippo. Filippo is actually quarantining in a hotel in Hong Kong and about two minutes before um, he, he started presenting, he had his latest little COVID test. So mm -hmm. um, <laughs> thank you, Filippo. Um, so I guess a, a question I've got, Filippo, is um, just you, you mentioned the impact that the US um, withhold and release orders or WROs are, are having. Um, Europe has just uh, voted to um, to put those in, and there's currently legislation which will go in Australia um, to our House of Reps in October, which is very, very similar to the WRO regime. What should businesses be doing to get ready for that? Uh, it's, a very, <laughs> it's a very good question. From my point of view, first of all, identify, use, use analytics, use data from, from my analytics point of view is use the data to understand, first of all, where are the problems? Where are the issues? We have WROs are often related to the risk of forced labor, right? So, and assessing where 
for instance, foreign migrant workers are, are more at risk, where domestic migrant workers are more at risk. And in those areas, focus on, uh, on, um, on specialized assessment for forced labor, which has not just simple audit, social audit, but a specialized assessment that requires often translator to talk to foreign migrant workers that really deep, deep dive into the, into the different dynamics of the modern slavery can take in the workplace. So specialized assessment to assess and monitoring so if it's very important to monitor the situation, audit are just a snapshot in time. So it's very important to integrate media information, make sure that you constantly collect information about specific factor, your regions, that you keep yourself updated, but also that you could collect data from the factory on a regular basis. Try not to be invasive, but still collect good quality data, assess the transparency of your data, and verify what is the what, what is the risk? Finally, there is the, the grievance mechanism process that I'm not really an expert, but it's important, of course, that um, to put in place effective grievance mechanism, anonymous grievance mechanisms in your among your suppliers to make sure that workers can report specific risk, extreme risk in an anonymous way. So these are the, first, are the things that I would um, definitely recommend. It will depend on the level of risk of different regions and products, but these are the, some of the, 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 the key action, the focus action. Carolyn, you might like to say something around uh, around uh, the um, um, uh, the uh, reporting and and um, uh, work uh, work of voice, etc. On that one. Oh yeah, could you, could you tell us a little bit more about the kind of work that you do in uh, in Elevate in like your labour link and the importance of work of voice in identifying issues of forced labour? Because I think that's a that's a very unique and useful mm. tool that Elevate has. Katie, do you wanna do? Do you wanna um, present on this? Or I was gonna say. I, 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 I was gonna say. I bet Felipe makes me do this. <laughs> Neither, <laughs> no. no, no, no. I'm happy to. I'm happy to. We have, if I'm not wrong, we have at, at the moment four different uh, Mexico, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and uh, another region that I don't. Even, the, uh, I don't remember right now, but we have uh, we have a labor link. We have we have uh, generated a, a direct mechanism for workers to report um, to report in real time um, egregious violations to our call uh, call uh, call centers, to our operators. They collect this information, they translate, and then they report it to us. Every time there is an extreme violation, we report it back to the to, to the client and we generate reports at the country level, at the sector level to understand, okay, do we see an increase in risk? What kind of risk are we seeing? Is a, is a, is a building safety, is a, is a risk of bonded labor? So these, these anonymous mechanism um, are then full of reporting mechanism and then follow up with, uh, um, with our grievance, make, uh, our, sorry, our, um, our uh, reparation mechanism, our, 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 our remediation mechanism to come into the work sites and, uh, and, and talk to the factory manager, understand the, 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 the issue and implement a work plan for the factories to, uh, or the, 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 the farms or the warehouses to uh, resolve the issues that was caused. Can, can you give yes, people sir. an idea of the scale of that too? Because I think that's phenomenal. How many workers are you covering at the moment with um, with uh, Labourlink? It's a good question. I don't remember the worker, but I can tell you that we collect 6,000 grievances every month. So that's quite a large scale when you think about the amount of information that we are internalizing, that we use our um, our algorithm. I am always gonna talk from the uh, analytics point of view, but also <laughs> because as a head of analytics, but the, the, the level of information that we collect, we transform and we report back, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's very large. And and, uh, and a lot of the information I see in first place, it's 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 really critical violations and uh, and and that really says a lot about the effectiveness of anonymous and effective uh, grievance mechanism in the supply chain. Yep. Sorry, Katie. As well, 
Yeah, I was going to say, as well as the grievous, um, grievous mechanisms, we also have um, a module, a part of our um, social audit that also includes worker engagement. So um, that is something that we do as, as a standard audit. That it doesn't need to be in response to a high number of grievances being, being reported, but it's something we can do. We can go in as part of our audit and, and, and speak, to, speak to workers um, directly, direct interviews with those workers as well. That's something else we do. What impresses us again and again is the actual yeah. the database that you have with that is one of the largest ones that we've come across. Um, there's been a couple yeah. of questions about the forced, uh, the, the bill being introduced in Australia. So it's passed the Senate. Um, it now needs to go and to this the bill House. Is, hmm? This bill is? The, it's called the Customs Amendment Bill on Forced Labour. And so it will amend the Customs Bill uh, the Customs um, Act uh, to include clauses around um, what, what is known as rebuttable presumption. That's the new phrase you need to know. So basically, if you're importing goods from certain areas that are high risk for forced labour, it will be presumed that there is forced labour in your product unless you can show otherwise. And therefore, its import into Australia will be banned. Wow. So, so it's very similar to a WIRO. Very the similar United to States. the US, yeah, and to what Europe is planning to do yep. in a number of other countries. So last week, Europe uh, forecast that they were also going to bring in a parallel one. This is, uh, we're not sure whether it's going to be a part of their Human Rights Due Diligence Act that's coming through uh, the EU. Uh, it's in the Commission. It'll be coming back to the EU Parliament. They hope the end of this year, but I think it's going to be next year before that comes in. So a future webinar we have planned is actually on where's legislation going and how do you get ready for the emerging legislations so that you actually don't get swipe swipe by it. So, but that's that's another webinar. We haven't quite got that in the in the um, schedule yet. So, Katie, were you going to make a comment then too? I was actually going to answer um, Karen's previous question um, that Filippo did also answer, and I think. Just one thing I wanted to say is, well, two things. One, knowledge is power. So I think Filippo's reference to the, to the data and arming yourself with, with information is, is, is critical. That might be through, through the media. It might be through your suppliers directly, through you know, things like self-assessment questionnaires, et cetera. But I think the other thing to say is you don't have to do everything at once. Um, it really it can sometimes seem a bit overwhelming, I think, to, to companies and businesses that, that haven't really addressed this topic before. Um, you don't have to do it all at once. It really can be a step-by-step -step process. Just start small. Start by looking at your risks. Start by then, you know, looking at your policies. Um, start by opening those conversations with your suppliers. It, 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 it's, it's, it's very rare and it's, it's very difficult for someone to change their entire procurement po um, practices overnight. Um, so it really is uh, just something that you, you start small and work up to. So don't be too intimidated by that. Questions come through here on, is the Customs Amendment Bill, the Forced Labour, otherwise known as the Rex Patrick Bill? Yes, it is known as that for those in Australia that have been following that. We've been working very, very closely with, uh, with Senator Rex uh, on this one. Uh, and he brought it in because the largest population of the Uyghur people uh, in Australia is actually in Adelaide, which is, and he's the Senator for South Australia. So they came to him, so he's following up. The voice which has come to him from the uh, from the Uyghur people in South Australia. Another question, um, Minette. Hi, Minette. Um, how have you seen tools such as audits, worker voice surveys, and grievance mechanisms um, applied well to other to deeper levels of the supply chain? For example, um, Minette, I'm, I'm assuming you're thinking about a garment supply chain. Um, but as, as companies try and go further down their supply chains, which I know you are, you know, what, what are the tools for the farm? What are the tools for spinning, weaving, dye and so on? We have recently launched, I think in the last year, a traceability service where we, um, we, we run survey, first of all, with, with the tier one suppliers to understand where the products are made. And uh, we do, um, uh, we collect the information about the tier two, the tier three suppliers. We try to retrace all the supply chain based on, uh, um, based on a specific product, based on what components goes into the product. So basically we're also able to assess eventually if the tier one has been disclosing enough information 
for, for, for that that they reflected the product as, as all the components put together. Once that information is, is put together, what we do, we do again a prioritization of risk. We see what specific products, what specific regions are more at risk. And then we might, according to the different clients, according to the resources available and the risk assessment, we might do um, online data collection with a specific survey. Or if we believe there is a higher level of risk, we might actually go um, um, do um, um, an assessment. And if we believe there is a risk of forced labor, we might integrate a, for, um, uh, a forced labor uh, risk assessment or a foreign migrant worker risk assessment. So uh, first of all, use traceability services and, uh, and traceability tools. And then through segmentation of risk understanding, what are the next steps? So how far off are we to getting down? It's different with different commodities. Getting down to tier three, four, five, because we know that that's where uh, a lot of the risk is, uh, Filippo, because as you said, uh, most of the risk or much of the risk is in the agricultural food and rural products. Yeah. How far off are we getting down to really digging down to the three, four, five tiers? It. It's um, it's a good question. Sorry, I think I had some uh, internet problem, but um, I think it's a good question. It re it re I, we have just started with a couple of clients and the response has been quite positive. We have seen uh, um, a, quite a systematic data collection so, um, and, and quite deep data collection, so that was quite positive, but it will depend a lot on the client on the pressure yet the relationship between the client and the tier one because that relationship how strategic how how uh, functional is that uh, relationship is also going to influence then how much of uh, information they will be the tier one is going to be able to collect down and how much information we are going to be able to collect down mm. down the supply chain so again uh it really it will depend on the product and it will depend on the type of relationship that we see uh between the buyer and their direct contractors one of the questions is how much has uh, covid uh covered over the ability to dig deeper in or not just to dig deeper sometimes even to get to tier one uh, uh, around the world. You, you named a number of the high-risk countries, but how has COVID affected things generally in trying to, to really get an accurate picture of what's happening on the ground with the risk? Well, first of all, a lot of buyers, they have not only the private sector, not only the public sector, but also the private sector has cut uh, for, for part of 2020, their budgets addressed to assessment. And there was a they generated a significant risk uh, on in the supply chain. A lot of the uh, suppliers stopped being audited. So that was definitely a challenge. When buyers resumed their assessment practices and came back commissioning for the assessment, we often had operational challenges in, in visiting, visiting specific areas, visiting specific factories. Factories would push back on external visitors for the risk of, uh, you know, because of the risk of introducing COVID in the, in the, in the factory. So there have been a systematic and, uh, and, and very different challenges in, in, in our assessment processes. But at the same time, what we really did is that try to expand the source of data that we collect. So it's not only about, it's not only about audits, it's also about grievance mechanism. It's also about um, media reports, uh, news that we collect constantly every day related to our suppliers and we build a database. And you can say a lot uh, from the news the, 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 you can speak, the, the, the spike that you see in protest, in, 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 for instance, in protest, Worker protests in specific regions, and you can really correlate that information with uh, with uh, with violation happening in 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 the specific region. So basically, we we the, the COVID laid this 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 sheet, this very opaque sheet on the supply chain. We are now resuming to actually be able to assess it. But in the meanwhile, we we also it was an opportunity for us to develop more tools and to make sure that the other tools available to collect other type of information were up and running uh, um, effectively. I'm trying to work out with this, this next question is an analytics question or just a prophetic question of uh, how after COVID, after we come out of COVID, 
how difficult it's going to get, be to get those sheets off and to actually start to dig down into uh, what uh, is going to be, well, really, it's what's going to be possible in the future coming out of COVID in digging down to those realities. I think we are experiencing right now, and this is very surprising given the place where we were in 12, years, uh, 12 months ago, we are experiencing right now a strong interest from businesses, from, uh, from stakeholders in the, of the supply chain, in really understanding what is going on. I think this is a bit of a boom of the, of the, of the, of the sustainability industry. We need to make sure that we ride this wave effectively, they implement the right tools and we do, we do our best. I, I am quite optimistic seeing where we are right now and where we are 12 months ago and where we can go. So I think we are on the right track, but you know, it's, it's all about businesses and businesses really need to put more effort. And uh, this effort will need to come eventually because with the significant uh, pressure coming from investors, government and NGOs, I think businesses right now are way more aware of what they have to do and immediately compared to where they were five years ago. One of the trends that we're picking up is that many governments around the world seem to be outsourcing human rights to businesses. And uh, um, in some areas, I guess that's understandable because businesses actually have more money than governments. But there seems to be a changing role in this area of human rights uh, between businesses and government and what have been traditionally government roles seem to be uh, being asked of businesses more and more. Uh, are you picking up uh, some of those trends? Definitely. I mean, uh, businesses are, are, are becoming instrumental in improving conditions in the supply chain, are required more and more, but this is also concerning. I, I am someone who believes that the importance of the local government in implementing effective regulations and tackling issues, business by itself can, can do a lot, but can't can solve the problem. So um, I, I think it's something that's welcoming. And the, the responsibility of the private sector in 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 sourcing product and making sure that they are sourcing uh, um, uh, in with the respect of the of the of the of the of the human rights of the workforce, health and safety in the environment. Uh, but at the same time, businesses can do all. And I am I person my personal opinion. I'm very welcoming of of the new regulation that we are seeing. Um, um, that's coming up in Australia, in EU finally, and uh, also the, the the Norwegian Modern Slavery Act that it's happening. So I think we need more of that. It's not. It can't be just about the business. It needs to be a duality. It needs to be a dual effort. One of the webinars uh, we are going to be doing in the future is actually looking at all these emerging legislations because uh, we're doing major research. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> it's, diffi it's difficult to keep track, and I'm really oh. looking forward to it. Just when we think we've got it done, Felipe, we find there's new things emerging. So we're just calling it a, a work in progress, <laughs> I think, on that one. Thank you so much for, um, uh, for uh, sharing those things and for uh, helping us understand uh, and digging much deeper, both to you and to Katie uh, and to David as well. The other thing is we want to say thank you again to, uh, to Elevate uh, and uh, we love working with them. For those who've not seen the um, introduction to modern slavery and uh, the Australian Modern Slavery Act, we did with Elevate, uh, with their um, communications department, uh, the most amazing people we've ever worked with uh, in that regard. And uh, that has been used uh, all around Australia and all around the world. So thank you so much to uh, Filippo and also to Katie and also to David, uh, David based down in Melbourne. And we hope this has been helpful and we hope that uh, we might have a chance of learning from each other and work out what we can do together to actually make a better world, clean businesses and become better societies. Thank you so much. Look Thanks forward for having us. Thanks for having us. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone.